a woman pulls into the turning lane just as the light turns red. She hears a new message chime on her phone. Since it's a long light, she pulls out her phone. You pull in behind her and turn on your blinker. You're pretty sure you see her looking at her phone and you hope she's paying attention to the light. Sure enough, it changes and she just sits there. You wait a full second before you honk, trying to be nice. Still, she just sits there. Other cars are honking now. You think about going up to see if she's okay. In her side mirror, you catch a glimpse of her face. She's crying. She's still staring at her phone and you get the sense she barely even hears the honking. Finally appearing to collect herself, she jerks her car forward and hurries through the intersection, just in time for the light to turn red again. What happened to her? It could have been anything, and the older you are, the more likely it is that whatever she's feeling, you've been there. I'm only 36 years old, and they picked a very weak and foolish person to teach this quarter. That's okay, because God loves using weak and foolish people, so He can prove He can use anyone. But I want to share with you what I've discovered as I've studied for these lessons. There are powerful truths we can learn from the lives of the women in Scripture. I'm so thankful this has forced me to study so I can enjoy these lessons. Hopefully you can too. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 that there's no temptation taken us but such as is common to man. I'm trusting that based on that verse, the things I'm tempted with can apply to you too. But please forgive me if anything I say doesn't apply to you. I'm trying to focus on the top ways I get tempted with the hopes it will help you too. As women, it's easy to feel alone, but 1 Corinthians 10 tells us we're all tempted in common ways. We must pass on the comfort and help and grace we've been given. To me, being a woman seems more complicated than ever. We're simultaneously encouraged to be assertive yet feminine, to lead strong yet follow the trends. We must be immaculate and also let it all hang out. We should speak our minds yet cut the whining. We should stand up for ourselves but not rock the boat. I'm beyond grateful God has designed for a church to be full of older women who can teach both by their words and by their examples, and not by always being perfect. Some of the best advice I've ever gotten was from women who said, Here's what I did wrong. Don't do it. Here's why. What a wonderful way to transform mistakes into ministry. Probably each of us have faced times we wished an older woman, who'd faced our exact circumstances, was there to guide us. Unfortunately, sometimes it's scary to share my mistakes. Sorry. Oh, someone just flushed the toilet. <laughs> not me. <laughs> it's intimidating to teach, especially when we're not sure it will be well received. God hasn't left us without guidance. The stories in the Bible have been put there as examples to show us what's happened to people before us. Like I said, the luxury of getting to teach this has been getting to make the time to dig deep and meditate on these stories of women in the Bible and how they relate to us today. God promises that if we meditate in His Word day and night, whatever we do will prosper. In Joshua 1, 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. As we ponder on the women in the Bible and compare them to women today, I think a common thread that runs throughout the history of womankind is power. Women have power. We don't need to have rallies and wave girl power signs. We already have power. We control things a great deal. I control the mood of my home. Sometimes that's a blessing and sometimes I think my family would be happier if I were at the store. Women control the tone of an organization just like we control the mood at home. Ever been in a meeting where a group of women was mocking the speaker? Do you remember catty girls at school who made life miserable for whoever crossed their paths? I wish I could say I've never made life miserable for people, but it'd be a lie. It's easy to see that women hold a lot of power. What makes the difference in whether our power results in good or evil is whether we're sitting in our own seat of power or whether we're out of our domain and grasping for another's power or control. That's what these classes are about. We're going to study how the women in the Bible dealt with power and control. And we're going to see where the use or misuse of power got them. Today, I'm so excited to share with you something from Eve's life that can help each of us immediately. The more I studied, the more excited about this I became because I saw that not only am I tempted just like Eve was, this one thing about Eve's story has the power to transform misery to paradise just as surely as Eve traded paradise for misery. Eve may have discovered this late, but not too late. In fact, this one thing made everything what Eve went through bearable, and it has the power to make everything we go through bearable. Eve is the mother of all living, and as the mother is, so is the daughter. So let's look at Eve and see how she gave up control when she believed she was gaining it. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for whoever's listening to this right now. And I pray that you'll bless that person. And I pray that you will help each of us to know how much you love us and help us to learn from this lesson. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. 
And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman that whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So we have a man, perfect. He walks with God. He has a purpose, a career, and the means to do it. He has everything he needs, and he lives in the most beautiful place imaginable. Yet God looks at him, and for the first time God says it is not good. Why? He's alone. Before we can understand womanhood, before we can understand ourselves, we must understand one fundamental thing. The story starts out with a man. This man has a need and woman is the answer, but at the root of all of it is the man. I love a good love story. And in the princess stories or the Amish fiction or the Hallmark movies, it's always about the girl. Very few stories tell about a man who's alone and focuses on him and then in sweeps the woman to be what he's missing. Instead, most of the stories I've heard show the woman, her beauty, her well-begotten state, and her need for a man. Then in comes Prince Charming to sweep her off her feet. In the story world I loved, it was all about the lady. Maybe that's why it was so hard for me to accept the verse I'm about to show you. It's so easy for me to forget this important point. I'm interested in food, clothes, education, success, spirituality, and definitely romance. But what I so often forget is that I'm not the purpose for the story. But the foundation of all of it is God, man, and a need. As long as I forget this, I stay frustrated. Like a prima donna who's been cast as a supporting character and thinks she should always be in the spotlight. We can go around in circles and talk all about how we as women deserve to be treated, but considering that this is a woman's class and we can't control how we're treated, let's focus on things from a woman's perspective. And we were made for men. God tells us this in the blunt chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul, a man who never married, writes about the places of men and women. So this wasn't just a man wanting his wife to listen to him. Paul was inspired and he told it without any ulterior motives. If we believe God loves us, this is one chapter we women can say, God, I trust you so much, I'm willing to believe even this chapter. 
Here's what it says. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. We were made for them. That's a humbling bite to swallow there. But God promises if we humble ourselves, He will lift us up. Before honor is humility. With the proud comes shame. I'll tell you something that I'm ashamed of. Blame. Ever since we got married, I've been tempted to blame my husband for whatever goes not perfect. Blame has been a companion of mine for many moons. I try to keep it hidden, but when there have been times when things were hard, that ugly blame monster got so big I couldn't hide it. When I forget that I was made for my husband and not the other way around, I automatically blame him for everything. It's quite addictive. Blame feels so wonderful at first. But like a drug, it rots my ability to change anything. As I blamed my husband, I felt so helpless because the thing about blame is, as long as the blame is on someone else, I'm powerless. So I felt helpless. So my goal for 2018, along with not being late anymore, is to mentally take the blame for things from now on. And I'm discovering that when I take the blame, it feels terrible, but suddenly I have the power to get past whatever the problem is. Because if it's my fault, I don't have to wait for anyone else to change. Anyway, back to the story. So we have this man who's alone, and it's not a good thing. Bad things happen when men feel alone. God has a mission for this man to accomplish. He's supposed to dress and keep the garden. He's named the animals. He's got this beautiful place, but he needs to share it to really enjoy it. So God puts him to sleep, and out comes this rib. In God's hand, this rib is fashioned as the most beautiful creature yet, woman. And why was she made beautiful? For man. To me, I don't know about you, that sounds so very counterculture. We were made beautiful for man. But read it, that's how it is. And it's absolutely fundamental for me to remember that. Otherwise, I'll never never fulfill God's plan for my life, which means I'll never be fulfilled. Now, I'm not just talking about marriage, although that too. Our identity as women is fundamentally based on this fact whether we're married or not. Regardless whether we're married or not, we still affect the men around us for good or for evil. We can influence them to do good and we can influence them to do evil. Of course, they're responsible for what they ultimately choose to do just like Adam was, but we have a crazy lot of influence. I remember when I was a little girl staring out the window at other cars as they'd pass, when I'd be driving along. I remember once as I was getting older, my mom saying, Rebecca, you just can't stare at men. I was secretly huffy. Why not? Because you just can't stare at men. You'll get in trouble that way. And when I say I should relate to men a certain way, I'm not saying I'm subservient to men or that I have to obey men in general. The only man I'm subject to is my husband. I appreciate my pastor, but I'm no more subject to him than I am your husband. As a church member in that capacity, as a teacher, I do answer to say pastor as a shepherd, but not as a man. The Bible clearly says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to be to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And it says, For after this manner in the old time the holy women also trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. So I only have to obey my own husband. But how I handle myself as a woman will either help or hinder mankind. How I handle control has the ability to inspire the men around me, or to cripple their desire to try anything for God. Woman's one job was to be a help to the man, not to control him. Her first and greatest failure was dropping the ball as his helper and leading him to disobedience when she thought she was doing a good thing. There are so many ways women throughout history have affected society for good or evil. I don't care if a woman was a peasant or a queen. Her power, her influence on men made waves that affect all generations to come. Modern culture is trying so hard to blur the differences between men and women, but the Bible tells us the truth. Not only are there differences, but in understanding and embracing those differences is the only way to be satisfied as a woman. It's the only way to die knowing I've done what I could. And if I fall for the lies of the culture, I'm no longer a friend of God, like Lot's wife whose love for a twisted culture shamed her and her family for all time. Above all, I must reject the lies that tell me I'm no different than a man. Even if I feel manly, even if we feel manly, we must reject that confusing thinking. Even if we have more than our share of testosterone, we are different. And the proof starts as early as 20 weeks in that first ultrasound. The next law, what I do doesn't affect men. It does affect them profoundly, as these lessons will show us. We aren't responsible for what they do, but we will answer for how we influence them to do what they do. Just like Eve did when she thought she was right. The third lie is that men don't really care about us. They do care, although they can be inspired to care more or discouraged from caring at all. The fourth lie is that my man is hopeless. No man is hopeless. Even David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband, died in a good old age full of days, riches, and honor, and Solomon his son reigned in his stead. That's the child Bathsheba would bear him, by the way. 
The fifth law is that I'm completely undesirable, powerless. What a terrible law with such terrible consequences. The beauty that exists in each lady has unspeakable potential. Not appreciating that beauty has disastrous results. I don't think any woman, any normal woman, truly appreciates how beautiful she really is. What a lie from the evil one that we aren't lovely, and we bite it so easily. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, in a few weeks. We all have the same assets. We can all smile. We can all say thank you. We can all say, how can I help you? We can all giggle. Those four simple things can transform any of us into a dream come true and a powerful influence for good. So how did Eve give up her influence for good and trade it for banishment from paradise? Just think she had one job. Everything they needed was provided. The man had been commanded to do a certain job, and he'd been given one rule. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Apparently he passed on the information, possibly adding to it that they shouldn't even touch it, because that's what she told the serpent. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Just think, the woman had everything. A husband who had eyes only for her. Beautiful animals. Amazing, healthy, delicious food. A perfect home. Yet her focus was drawn to the one thing she didn't have. She allowed herself to be convinced she needed what God had not provided. Why? It was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was desirable for a good cause. It was reported to offer wisdom. So she let all the wonderful things around her pale in comparison to the lure lure of that one thing she had not been given. And we do the same thing. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It says His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Yet we so easily let our minds be drawn to the things He's not given us. Just as the woman focused on what she hadn't been given, we do the same, and for the same reasons. We want to make sure we have good food. We want to make sure we're provided for. I like to stock up. I hate the prospect of an empty freezer, an empty pantry. Give us this day our daily bread and practice is a scary thing for me. I like to know that the week's meal ingredients are waiting on me. And it's nice to have enough so I don't have to go to the store for a week if necessary. That's a good thing. God has provided those things. It's good to save up. It's good to stock up. The problems come when suddenly God doesn't provide those things. When He only provides for that day. Because there have been seasons when the freezer was empty and the pantry was empty. And I wasn't sure what I was going to make for dinner. We always ate, but I didn't always know where it was going to come from, and I hated it. But that's where God had me for that season, and I was fretting over food, just like Eve. And she was drawn to it because it was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, how we struggle with this as women. We can be so such perfectionists in all in different ways. We can be so particular about making sure everything looks lovely. It's a wonderful gift. But when God doesn't provide for things to be lovely for a season, it's a very trying thing. Like when you spend an hour cleaning out your closet and come into the living room to discover the kids have wrecked the rest of the house. It can be very tempting to step out of God's will just to get this looking perfect or at least pleasant to the eyes again. Sometimes we just have to accept that things aren't going to be perfect for this season. They're not going to look good. You're not going to have a good appearance for this season. Maybe you're trying to make a slideshow for your Sunday school class and your little one wants to hear Curious George. It's so tempting to choose beauty over best. Perfectionism can hit all of us in different places, but when we're tempted to step outside where God has told us to be, for the sake of appearances, we're headed for destruction. And she was tempted because it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. The serpent said so. That was what the story was. It would make you wise. I should want this if I want to be wise, she thought. And that's so how we get into trouble. We think, but I need this. It's going to tell me what I really need to know. Like Eve, we ignore the knowledge we've been given and go in search of forbidden knowledge. If I watch that show, I'll understand things I've always wanted to know. If I read that article, all my sex questions will be answered. If I ignore my husband's wishes and sign up for that class, I'll gain knowledge that I ought to have. And we discard the things we know already and cross the line because we lack wisdom and we think this is how to get it. So we listen to that woman who's not the best example because she seems to have this wisdom we lack. We follow those ungodly examples because they know the seven secrets to fill in the blank. We do what we've been told not to do because those in the know say it's necessary to be successful. And then we encourage our men to follow us. 
When I was a little girl, I was so angry at Eve. The older I get, the more thankful I am it was her and not me, because I'd hate for all generations to hate me. And I'd have certainly done what she did because I've done what she did, many times over. So Eve gave the fruit to her husband, and he did eat. And their eyes were opened, and they were naked. Suddenly, with knowledge came shame. Adam knew he was wrong to eat the fruit. The woman didn't. She truly believed she was right. She was deceived. Maybe that's why some men are so quiet. Maybe they know they're wrong when we're convinced we're right. They know we're wrong. I bet Adam was pretty quiet as he followed her lead. What's wrong, Adam? Why don't you talk to me anymore? I wonder what it was like as they first discovered that wind in the nether regions. Oh, we've got to cover up. And what did they cover? Well, the aprons I've seen pretty much just covered the gender identity. Now, in their eyes, it's not so blatantly obvious who the man is and who the woman is. They're more equal. In the Bible, I looked up the word for aprons, and it's talking about girdle. It's pretty much just talking about down there. So what were they planning? How long were they planning to hide in their aprons, hiding their intimate parts and flaunting everything else? Would it fool God when he found them? Would he be confused about who is who? Would the man get out of trouble? I wonder if the woman liked the new feeling of equality. And then came the discovery. The woman listened as God demanded whether Adam had disobeyed. He was, after all, the one he'd commanded. And her beloved husband jerked his finger her way. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. The blame, the betrayal. So she blames the serpent who doesn't deny it. And after listening to the serpent's curse, the woman had to face the truth that deception is not an excuse strong enough to erase consequences. It was still too early to see that her sin would mean she'd one day lose a son at the murdering hand of her firstborn. She had no way of knowing the pain future generations would reap because of the seed she'd sown. Good for her she couldn't hear the countless women throughout history ready to push who were cursing her. I'm guessing it was enough to see her husband's rage and blame. But when God pronounced judgment, something happened. Yes, she felt blame. Yes, she felt shame. Yes, she felt powerless. But something else happened. Grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In her pain, she could hear the judgment. But I wonder if she also heard the grace. With greatly multiplied sorrow would come greatly multiplied empathy. She would get to enjoy a better heart with that sorrow. The Bible says sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of countenance the heart heart is made better. She would know the joy of comforting by the sorrow she'd experience. There's nothing like getting to pass on comfort that you've experienced, and she was going to get to know that. With greatly multiplied conception would come babies. Being a woman is a physically painful thing. Most of us have hated Eve at times for what she's gotten us. Cramps, PMS, morning sickness, miscarriage, Braxton Hicks, false alarms in the middle of the night, screaming pain, crowning, after pains, mastitis. But every one of those is nothing compared to the baby in your arms. I have never once thought about complete effacement while I listen to my baby's sighs of sweet baby breath and watch those little dreaming smiles and pouts in the same instant. Even the babies I lost aren't lost forever. I will go to them, but they won't come to me in this life. I have the feeling those reunions will be so far beyond even the joy of holding a baby on earth. With a desire to her husband's comes romance. Sure, there's plenty of pain with love. Let me count the ways. There's fear and risk and possible loss of everything. But there's also love. And those times when by God's grace I submit, I'm subject, and I even reverence my husband, it's too sweet for words, and all the pain pales in comparison. But even beyond that, even beyond how God redeems, even the pain makes it so beautiful you're glad it happened. Something else so much greater. He introduced a brand new thing. I'm not sure if the concept had ever entered their minds. Substitution. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. For them to have skins or coats of skins, something had to be skinned. Death had to happen. One of those beautiful animals had to die to get skinned. It was apparently the first time anything had ever died according to Romans 5.12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Just imagine the shock of that first lifeless body. Those skins may be still bloody. The guilty relief as it sinks in that that should have been me. The realization that God is willing to accept a substitute in the place of a guilty sinner. That's really what every one of these stories is going to show. Jesus. He is the good ending to every story. 
Because as awful as what happened to Eve was, it wasn't the end. It was only the beginning of the story of the ages. God had a plan for her, and it was good. Yes, she botched it, but Seth would come. Sadness would come, but so would joy. And that joy would never have happened for any of us without Eve. Because through the mother of all living would come the one who would redeem her, Jesus. That is the one thing that can transform any bad thing we go through into something so beautiful it's like paradise. No matter what you've been through, no matter how you've failed or been blamed or suffered, look to Jesus and you can rest. He is our peace. He is our strength. He is our strong rock. If you ever feel powerless, you are this close to true power. It's found in Christ alone.